Picture this. It's 550 AD. You're standing on a hilltop, overlooking the vast forests of Central Europe. Below you, the Roman world is crumbling. Gothic kingdoms stretch from Spain to the Black Sea. Scythian horsemen still thunder across the Ukrainian steppes. The Balkans echo with Illyrian war cries. Now blink. At 650 AD just one century later, the Goths gone, the Scythians vanished, the Illyrians raced from existence. In their place, from the Baltic to the Adriatic, from the Elba to the Volga, a single people dominates, the Slavs. How does a third Europe's population just disappear? And how does another people previously invisible to history suddenly control territories larger than the Roman Empire at its peak? This is the greatest magic trick in European history. For over a thousand years we've been watching the wrong hand. Here's what makes this mystery so unsettling. Every other major European people left archaeological breadcrumbs leading back millennia. The Germanic tribes you can trace their pottery, their burial customs, their languages back 3,000 years. The Celts, even further. But the Slavs' archaeological silence until the 6th century it's as if they materialized from thin air. Roman historians were obsessed with barbarian tribes. They cataloged everything Gothic clans, Celtic druids, Germanic warbands. Jordanes wrote entire books about Gothic genealogies. Tacitus documented Germanic customs in excruciating detail. Yet when it comes to the people who would eventually outnumber all other Europeans combined, we get four mentions. Four. In all of classical literature, first appears in 512 AD, when Byzantine chronicler Procopius writes about mysterious Sclaveni raiders. Not ancient Slavs with rich histories, just raiders, appearing as if from nowhere. But here, said the truly bizarre part. Linguistic analysis suggests, Slavic languages only began diverging from each other around 500 to 600 AD. This means that at the exact moment, Slavs explode across half of Europe. They're all still speaking essentially the same language. Think about what this implies. People with no visible history suddenly conquers half a continent while speaking a single, unified language. It's like discovering that aliens invaded Earth, but all the evidence was classified until yesterday. Something is very, very wrong with this picture. For over a century, historians fought a bitter war over two theories. The autochthonists believed Slavs were always in Central Europe, just invisible until they weren't. The migrationists argued for a small tribe exploding outward from the Pripet marshes. Both sides had evidence. Archaeological cultures that might be proto-Slavic, linguistic reconstructions pointing to specific regions, river names that sounded Slavic. But it was all circumstantial until genetics entered the courtroom. When scientists first sequenced DNA from modern Slavic populations, they found what looked like a smoking gun. Haplogroup R1A. This white chromosome marker appeared in staggering frequencies, over 50% in Poland, Russia, and Ukraine. Finally, the Slavic signature, the genetic stamp of the Great Expansion. But then came the plot twist that changed everything. R1A wasn't just found in Slavs. It was everywhere along the ancient Indo-European migration routes. Indians, Iranians, Scandinavians carried it. It was ancient. Over 20,000 years old. Finding R1A in a Slav was like finding a Toyota Camry at a crime scene in Los Angeles. Sure, it's evidence of human presence, but it doesn't tell you who was driving. The genetic detective story seemed to hit a dead end. Until scientists learned to read the fine print. The revolution came when geneticists developed techniques to identify specific subcladesunger branches of ancient haplogroups. It was like going from someone drove a car to reading the actual license plate number. Two subclades of R1A changed everything. Z280 and M458. These weren't ancient, broad markers. They were recent, precise, and almost exclusively found in Slavic-speaking populations. Z280 dominated in Eastern Slavs Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, M458 was concentrated in Western Slavs Poles, Czechs, Slovaks. Both emerged around 4,000 to 5,000 years ago in the heart of Europe. This was at the genetic signature of the Slavic homeland, the DNA equivalent of a smoking gun with fingerprints on it. The case seemed closed. A small population carrying these markers had expanded outward, conquering vast territories through superior numbers or military technology. But when archaeologists began testing ancient DNA from pre-Slavic Europe, they uncovered something that shattered every assumption about European history. The DNA didn't just challenge the textbook story. It revealed that everything we thought we knew about the Slavic expansion was a lie. Let's start with Poland. Ground zero for the most shocking discovery. Before 500 AD, everyone agrees who lived here. Germanic tribes. The Goths, who would sack Rome. The Vandals, who would conquer North Africa. Archaeological evidence is crystal clear Germanic pottery, Germanic burial practices, Germanic everything. Then. According to history, they all left. 
The Great Migration period swept them westward, leaving empty lands for Slavic settlers. But when geneticists tested ancient Polish skeletons from before and after the supposed Slavic arrival, they found something impossible to explain with the standard story. The pre-500 AD skeletons were indeed Germanic carrying typical Germanic white chromosome markers and autosomal DNA profiles. But here's the kicker. The post-500 AD Slavic skeletons carried the Slavic M458 mark on their father's side. But their overall genetic profile, their complete DNA, signature showed massive continuity with the Germanic population that supposedly vanished. The math was inescapable. The vast majority of genes in medieval Polish Slavs came from the Germanic peoples who were supposed to be gone. They hadn't left. They hadn't been replaced. They had been transformed. But how and by whom? The Polish paradox was just the beginning. Similar patterns emerged everywhere scientists looked. Slavic expansion wasn't what it appeared to be. It was something far more mysterious and far more sophisticated. The next piece of the puzzle came from the Ukrainian steppes, where an even more shocking transformation had occurred. For over a millennium, these grasslands belonged to the Scythian Zeranian speaking nomads, whose golden artifacts still dazzled museum visitors. Greek historians wrote entire volumes about their customs. Persian kings feared their mounted archers. Then, According to traditional history, they simply vanished, replaced by humble Slavic farmers. But genetic analysis of ancient Scythian remains revealed something extraordinary. Their DNA profile was remarkably similar to the Yamnaya. Kulchera, the original Indo-Europeans, who had emerged from these same steppes thousands of years earlier. When scientists compared this ancient Scythian DNA to modern Ukrainians and Southern Russians, the connection was immediate and undeniable. The Scythians hadn't vanished, their descendants were still there, now speaking Slavic languages and calling themselves Slavs. But here's what makes this discovery so profound. We're not talking about small genetic contribution. In many regions, the majority of the genetic heritage came from these pre-Slavic populations. The legendary horse lords of the steppe, the terror of the ancient world, had become Slavic-speaking farmers. Their language died, their warrior culture disappeared, but their bloodline survived under a completely new identity. This wasn't conquest wasn't replacement. This was something far more subtle and far more powerful. Total cultural transformation while preserving the genetic substrate. The most explosive evidence came from the Balkans, where the genetic story completely demolishes modern national mythologies. When Slavic speakers arrived here in the 6th-7th centuries, they encountered Illyrians, Thracians, and Dacians peoples who had been trading and fighting with Greeks and Romans for centuries. Standard history says these indigenous Balkan peoples were conquered or displaced by the arriving Slavs, who then became the ancestors of modern Serbs, Croats, and Bulgarians. But the genetics tell a radically different story. While some Slavic or 1A markers are present, they're often not dominant. Instead, another haplogroup rules the Balkans, I2A. I2A is ancient European royalty, the bloodline of the very first. Hunter-gatherers who populated this continent over 10,000 years ago, these people were in the Balkans before any Indo-Europeans, before any Romans, and certainly before any Slavs. The implications are staggering. Huge percentages of modern South Slavs are not descended from Slavic migrants on their paternal side. They are the direct genetic descendants of the indigenous Balkan peoples, Slavicized Illyrians and Thracians. The conquerors didn't replace the conquered, the conquered adopted the conqueror's language while preserving their own ancient bloodline. But this raises an even more disturbing question. If this pattern exists in Poland, Ukraine, and the Balkans, where else might we find it? As genetic studies expanded across Eastern Europe, the same shocking pattern appeared everywhere. In Czech Republic, pre-Slavic Celtic genetic markers dominate, overlaid with Slavic culture. In Slovakia, Hungarian and Germanic genetic heritage preserved under Slavic linguistic identity. In Belarus, Baltic genetic substrates mixed with Slavic cultural markers. In Russia, Phenugreek genetic contributions in the north, a Turkic in the south, all unified under Slavic linguistic identity. The evidence was overwhelming. The Slavic expansion wasn't primarily a demographic phenomenon, it was a cultural virus that spread across Europe, assimilating existing populations while preserving their genetic heritage. But this raises the ultimate question. What kind of cultural system was so powerful it could override the ethnic identities of Goths, Scythians, Illyrians, and dozens of other established peoples? To understand how Slavic culture achieved this unprecedented success, we need to examine what made it different from every other early medieval society. Unlike the rigid hierarchies of Germanic kingdoms or the complex clan structures of Celtic societies, early Slavic social organization was remarkably fluid and adaptive. 
Archaeological evidence shows small, egalitarian settlements with flexible leadership structures. Their agricultural techniques were perfectly suited to the temperate forests and river valleys of Eastern Europe. While other cultures struggled with the post-Roman collapse, Slavic farming methods actually thrived in the new conditions. Most importantly, Slavic religious and cultural practices were unusually tolerant and syncretic. They absorbed local deities, customs and traditions, rather than replacing them entirely. But the real secret weapon was linguistic. Early Slavic languages had a unique grammatical structure that made them exceptionally easy to learn as a second language. The verb system was more regular than Latin, the noun cases more logical than Germanic languages. In the chaos following the fall of Rome and the collapse of the Hunnic Empire, this cultural toolkit proved irresistible. Local populations didn't just adopt Slavic customs, they discovered that Slavic ways of organizing society actually worked better than their ancestral systems. It was the most successful cultural software package in European history, running perfectly on any ethnic hardware. So why was this complex? Fascinating story, reduced to simple myths of pure ethnic expansion? The answer lies in the political needs of the 19th and 20th centuries. As the age of empires gave way to the age of nations, political movements needed simple, powerful origin stories. Panslavism required the myth of shared blood ties to unite Poles, Russians, and Serbs under common cause. Later, the Soviet Union needed the fiction of a unified Slavic Brotherhood to justify its sphere of influence. The Warsaw Pact wasn't just a military alliance, it was supposedly a reunion of long-separated Slavic cousins. A complex story of cultural assimilation and genetic continuity was not just inconvenient for these political projects, it was dangerous. A history suggesting that Poles have Germanic roots, Ukrainians have Scythian heritage. Serbs descend from ancient Balkan peoples threatens the very foundation of ethnic nationalism. Blurred ethnic boundaries are the enemy of political movements that require clear divisions between us and them. The truth wasn't buried by time, it was buried by politics. So we return to our original question, who were the Slavs? The DNA evidence provides an answer more profound than any nationalist mythology. The Slavs were not a single people defined by blood or soil. They were a linguistic and cultural phenomenon that swept across Europe, offering existing populations a new identity while preserving their ancient genetic heritage. The genius of the Slavs wasn't in conquest, it was in assimilation. In their remarkable ability to absorb, transform, and unify diverse peoples under a common cultural framework. To be Polish is to carry the genetic echo of Gothic warriors who once terrorized. To be Ukrainian is to inherit the blood of Scythian horsemen who rode with the wind across endless steppes. To be Serbian is to bear the ancient DNA of Illyrian mountain chiefs who defied Roman legions. And to be all of them to be Slavic is to be united not by shared ancestry, cultural transformation. The forbidden history of the Slavs is not the story of a single conquering tribe. It is the story of dozens of European peoples who found in Slavic culture something so compelling, so adaptive, so genuinely superior to their ancestral ways, that they willingly transformed their entire identity while secretly preserving their genetic heritage. It is a story written in our DNA, encrypted in our genes. And finally, after centuries of political suppression ready to be read, the greatest magic trick in European history wasn't making entire peoples disappear, it was making them all into Slavs, while keeping their ancient bloodlines alive. The secret was never hidden in buried artifacts or lost manuscripts. It was hidden inside us all along, waiting for science to develop the tools to decode what our ancestors always knew. That culture is more powerful than blood. Identity is something far more mysterious and wonderful than simple genetics could ever explain. This is the forbidden history of the Slavs. This is the story they didn't want you to know. And now that you know it, you'll never look at Eastern European history the same way again. Thanks for watching.